a country colloquially referred to as a meat lover's paradise, slowly going vegan? Let's discuss. I found this interesting article in the Washington Post that was published yesterday, March 18th. Plant-based diets are slowly gaining popularity in meat-loving South Korea. However, when you actually click on the article, the title is How to Go Vegan in South Korea, a Meat Lover's Paradise. I'm not sure why there's two different titles. I'm not sure if that's a thing that publications do just like test out different titles. Either way, this article discusses the challenges as well as the growing interest in adopting plant-based diets in South Korea. This article caught my eye because if someone were to ask me what I would think some of the least vegan-friendly countries are currently, South Korea would probably be somewhere toward the top of my list. So to see that that's potentially changing, I was definitely curious to hear more. The article was written by a South Korean-based journalist named Minju Kim, which I thought was interesting to get the perspective of a Korean person currently living in South Korea. And the article gets into some pretty insightful and honestly kind of mind-blowing stuff. So that's what we'll be discussing today, and let's get into it. Some places call it plant-based, others say reduced Reducitarian or flexitarian, the veg curious might introduce meatless Mondays. But here in South Korea, some are simply aiming for no chunk. Cut down on your meat consumption by avoiding obvious bits of meat, but turning a blind eye to what's less visible. This is the first time I have heard of the no chunk philosophy. And I have to say, it certainly paints a picture. And I find it really interesting in my observations, animal products being more seamlessly incorporated into a food tend to be easier for people to ignore than obvious chunks. Across the developed world, as people become more conscious of the meat industry's relatively large carbon footprint, there are movements aimed at reducing the consumption of animal products if not becoming outright vegan. That effort is particularly tricky in South Korea, where meat is associated with wealth and health and where tabletop barbecuing is a way of life. I first want to address the association with wealth. There's a Guardian article that I referenced a lot that I made a video about a few years ago called Why Do People Hate Vegans? That gets into a lot of really interesting historical context for meat eating. As many of us know, meat used to be really expensive due to its rarity and also the time and resources required to raise an animal for consumption. So it was really a specialty and a rare delicacy to most people. And as the author puts it in the Guardian article, in the course of just over a century, meat went from unattainable luxury to dietary cornerstone. These days we feel entitled to meat every day. I love that wording of feeling entitled to meat. To me that really summarizes the attitude. Like it's gone from a once in a while thing to how dare you insinuate I shouldn't have meat at every meal. I literally might die if I don't eat it. The author of the Guardian article was based in the UK, so I'd say that the article really looks at things through a UK and US historical lens, but I'd argue that that general attitude about meat could be applied to many different cultures. Just the timing at which meat became an everyday attainable thing may be a little different from country to country. And I'd say pretty much worldwide, meat isn't really explicitly seen as a luxury anymore, but the cultural fixation on it seems to be a carryover from a time when it was a luxury. And to address the part about tabletop barbecuing, Korean barbecue is obviously a very popular form of dining, not just in Korea, but all over the world, certainly here in the US. I was dragged to Korean barbecue restaurants uh, a couple of times when I lived in LA, which for myself being vegetarian at the time was not the most pleasant experience. Pretty sure I ordered you know, a bibimbap bowl or something like that. For those unfamiliar with the concept, each table has an open flame grill built into the center of it, and you are brought raw meat, and either you cook the meat yourself or sometimes the staff will cook it. Really seems dicey having people handling and cooking raw meat themselves. That's what I remember from when I went, but then again, that was probably like 2010 or 11. Along with the meat is served rice and dipping sauces and also panchan, which 
are small side dishes set around the table to be shared. Panchan, I would say, are primarily plant-centered foods like kimchi, different versions of pickled vegetables with spices, tofu, and many other things. I'm not saying that they're all vegan because actually many of them include fish or egg ingredients, but they seem to be generally pretty plant-forward. Back to the article. I tried my best even setting a cute photo of pigs as my phone wallpaper, said Jung Jin Ah, a committed animal rights activist who has been struggling to give up meat for more than a decade. She wanted to save the planet and the animals, but she wanted sizzling pork belly too. The pork and chicken are right in front of my eyes and will immediately satisfy my cravings, whereas the values I uphold by refusing meat are invisible, said Jung, who wrote a book about her life as an imperfect vegetarian. Lots of interesting stuff in this quote. I found it really interesting that she specifically referenced the sizzle as sort of the siren song of the pork. This really supports the argument of the importance of the food experience overall, not just the food itself, but things like how it's prepared and the sensorial experience associated with that. How many people have ordered fajitas in a restaurant just to have the theatrics of a sizzling, steaming platter being delivered to their table? I remember when I was younger in restaurants and I'd see that, I'd be like, what is that? I want it. I don't care what it is. I want that. I also want to address what this woman said about chicken and pork being immediately available versus her invisible values. That to me kind of comes down to people's desire for instant gratification and possibly speaks to to someone not having a strong enough connection to animal cruelty or their reason for not wanting to contribute to it. Because for me, and I'm sure for many of you, that voice and that reason are very strong and prominent in my head, much stronger than like a food is there and I want it voice. The article continues, after K-pop and K-dramas, K-BBQ may well be South Korea's best known cultural export. The Korean method of grilling meat is beloved by diners around the world and attracts foodie tourists. Korean food has risen as one of the most popular cuisines on TikTok and Instagram, according to a 2023 analysis of social media tags. The Oscar-winning film Parasite featured grilled Korean beef with instant noodles, fueling a social media frenzy. At home, it's a national pastime, whether at an after work gathering or a picnic dinner on a portable grill. Speaking of KBBQ being one of South Korea's most famous exports, there's something I had been noticing for a while and been curious about, and I finally decided to look into it. As some of you know, I'm a huge fan of figure skating. I follow it closely. World Championships are this week. And I've noticed over the last few seasons that the Korean skaters all have the letters BBQ on their official Team Korea skating jackets. And I always wondered if that had to do with Korean barbecue but I was kind of like, why would it just say BBQ? Like, is that a sponsor? So I finally looked into it and I found out that indeed it does. One of their sponsors is BBQ Chicken, which touts itself as Korea's number one chicken restaurant and also says they're the number one franchise brand in Korea. Korea has historically had and continues to have some of the best figure skaters in the world. And I think it says a lot that Korean barbecue has such a prominent placement on their jackets during these internationally aired competitions. It seems like a major part of the appeal of Korean barbecue is that it fosters a sense of community and coming together. And truly, what could be a more primal and primitive human experience than gathering around a flame while food cooks? So I truly do understand why people enjoy it so much, but I would question if it has that much to do with the meat or more to do with the fun of cooking food yourself, sharing the experience with friends and loved ones, and also all of the flavors that come from the dipping sauces, which seem to be entirely plant-derived, as well as, of course, the panchan served with it. So Korean barbecue seems like an experience that could pretty easily be veganized, either by using plant-based meats or tofu and tempeh, or honestly just vegetables. And maybe there are places that have done that, I'm sure. <laughs> 
there are other people that have thought of this. In terms of Korean cuisine being veganized in general, of course, we've had some wonderful food influencers that have really showcased that, like the Korean vegan. The article continues, meat has always been an aspirational meal here. It was a luxury during South Korea's emergence from colonization and war, but after decades of rapid economic growth, meat has now taken over Korean dinner tables. South Korea's annual meat intake per person exceeded that of rice for the first time in 2020. It's now 134 pounds, much lower than the annual American meat per capita consumption of 225 pounds. Yeah, good luck beating us guys, but up from 69 pounds two decades ago. Now it's rare to walk more than two blocks in central Seoul at 7 p.m. without inhaling the aroma of grilled meat. This country of 51 million has more than 70,000 barbecue restaurants. Some pretty interesting numbers here. First, the acknowledgement of Korea's economic growth over the last few decades. Um, is a huge factor here. As I mentioned before, meat's cultural significance as a food only for the wealthy is no longer really relevant, but that sort of fixation on it really has endured. It seems very significant that South Korea's meat intake exceeded their rice intake for the first time a couple years ago. I checked in with a friend and former co-worker of mine, uh, Ben, who is Korean. He also has a fabulous YouTube channel called Wobi Design. Check it out. Here's what he said. Historically, Korean foods have been mainly vegetables and fish. It was a very poor country, so they didn't have access to meat. I asked him when he thought that started to change, and he said, I think around the 80s to the 90s, the country grew rapidly. I had also wondered, in addition to economic growth, if the proliferation of American fast food chains in Korea had contributed to the increase meat intake. I found this hospitality review on chain restaurants in Korea that gave me the exact information I was looking for. It was not until the 1980s that Korean food service became a modern enterprise with strong management emphasis. In 1982, Burger King signed a franchise contract and started operations in Korea. In the following two to seven years, American chain restaurants such as Wendy's and KFC, both in 1984, Pizza Hut in 1985, McDonald's in 1986, Denny's in 1987, Coco's in 1988, and Domino's Pizza in 1990 penetrated the Korean food service market. So this sort of explosion of American fast food chains in Korea in the 80s certainly aligns with Ben's estimate of when Koreans began eating a lot more meat. Back to the article, but some climate change activists and animal rights advocates are coming up with creative ways to question this ubiquitous carnivore culture and embrace plant-based eating. One of the biggest challenges for aspiring vegetarians and vegan vegans in South Korea is that they don't know where to start. Meat and seafood appear in some form in nearly every meal. Small and sometimes incognito ingredients like tiny fermented shrimp and kimchi, minced meat and bibimbap, or seafood stock in sizzling tofu soup. Given the pervasiveness of animal products and dishes and a lack of awareness of vegetarian needs, it can be tricky to go meat-free at restaurants or when communally dining. This all completely makes sense. From what the author's describing, it seems like the culture is maybe slightly behind in terms of their awareness of and therefore ability to cater to vegetarians and vegans. And maybe that's due to South Korea's relatively more recent economic growth as compared to other countries like maybe the US or the UK, for example. These difficulties have given rise to the bidyong or no chunk approach to plant-based eating among budding vegetarians in South Korea. For Jong Kyung Mi, bidyong means making her best effort to avoid visible chunks of meat when circumstances do not allow eating vegetarian, especially when dining out or sharing a meal with omnivores. A strict vegan diet, which was her initial goal three years ago, was hard to practice while living with a non-vegetarian husband and child. We tend to be preoccupied with the extremes when going meat-free, she said. However, a realistic diet that we can actually sustain is more effective and meaningful. Of course, the struggle of being the only vegan in a non-vegan household is not exclusive to South Korea, and I certainly agree that doing anything is better than doing nothing. Nothing. But I find it really interesting that this approach is so common in South Korea that they have a word for it. I did search for the words bidyong and no chunk, and outside of this article, I couldn't find anything, at least not in my English searches. Perhaps it's not something that has really been discussed in English yet. On social media, the hashtag MyVeganismDiary has become popular, amplifying the voices of those trying to go meat-free and influencing a new generation of plant-centric eaters. On 
On Instagram, South Koreans share their experience of attempting and sometimes succeeding, but often failing to eat vegan and encourage others to join the challenge. I did look through this hashtag on Twitter and found a lot of posts using it. It was really interesting seeing all the different pictures of food people were eating and, you know, using the translation feature and reading about their vegan journeys. In general, social media has its ups and downs, but people certainly do seem to love a good social media challenge. So if that's a way to encourage people in South Korea to eat more vegan food, then I think that's great. The social media trend has been a source of motivation for South Korean illustrator Kim Bo Sun. She posted a series called My Veganism Cartoon on social media in which she playfully depicts the ups and downs in her life as an aspiring vegan. I started working on these cartoons in hopes that it would inspire more imperfect vegans like myself, she said. I think 100% imperfect aspiring vegans are more valuable for our planet than a single perfect vegan. I wish I could read these cartoons, but I do love the drawings and I, I think it's such a cool concept of expressing the difficulty of being vegan through illustration. It's cutesy, it's fun. Uh, like I said, I wish I could read them. And it's just interesting to think that these people seem to be the sort of leaders of the vegan movement in Korea. Like it's a little different maybe from leaders of the vegan movement in different countries. Like what the vegan movement looks like there is like, we're trying, okay? We're trying here, but it's hard. So I don't know, obviously this article is really just the author's research and interpretation of the vegan culture there. The country's economy has grown to become the world's 13th largest, and it is the 10th biggest carbon polluter across the globe, according to the Global Carbon Atlas. The Asian Economic Powerhouse is one of the lowest performers in the Climate Change Performance Index, which assesses the national greenhouse gas emissions, energy mix, and climate policy of 63 countries and the European Union. South Korea's topography means that livestock is often raised in crowded factory farms, which contributes to air and water pollution. We sort of touched on this earlier, but the reason that that meat is now available to pretty much everyone at a somewhat affordable price is due to the proliferation of the practice of factory farming. I do wonder also if there was a correlation between the presence of the American chain restaurants and factory farming. Have to think, yes, fast food is able to be fast food for a reason. When living beings are involved, food where you order here and then pick it up here a few minutes later, is not going to be good for the animals. Some companies see a huge potential market in alternative protein sources, although they concede that selling to meat-loving Koreans is no easy feat. Our products are delicious enough to win over not only vegetarians, but also non-vegetarians who have never tried alternative meat, said Kim Young-hee, CEO of HN Novatech, a Korean food tech startup that developed the world's first seaweed ingredient for plant-based meat alternatives. So that ingredient sounds pretty promising and interesting. I can't imagine seeing seaweed tasting like meat, but I have seen some companies in the US doing similar with kelp, I believe. The government is taking notice. The Agriculture Ministry recently unveiled a plan to support the plant-based economy by establishing a dedicated study center for plant-based meat alternatives and increasing the exportability of the products. The country's plant-based protein market could reach $216 million by 2026, according to estimates by the Korea Rural Economic Institute. Apparently, South Korea is only the second country after Denmark mark to establish a national action plan for the plant-based food industry. Whether or not this is purely economics focused, seeing the government of such a meat-dependent country and also a country that has had such successful economic expansion in the last few decades, being like, yeah, we're gonna focus on plant-based meats now, this is, this is gonna be our new thing, this is gonna be our new big export, is pretty exciting. If it is possible to recreate that familiarity of taste, texture, and most importantly, sizzle of animal meats with plant-based versions, maybe that would be a viable option or an acceptable alternative for at least some Koreans. But there are still far more skeptics than proponents. Saturday night means going out for pork belly and soju with friends, said Philip Lee, a soul-based soccer coach who eats barbecue every weekend. Lee says he's aware of vegetarianism and supports the movement, but I cannot see myself ever giving up meat. This reminds me of the meme that's something like, I could never go vegan, said every vegan at one point.
point, the sentiment that this man shared underscores the social aspect of consuming animal products for so many people, but believing that you can only meet up with friends for delicious food and drinks on a Saturday night if you consume meat is what I would consider a limiting belief. Another man interviewed said his vegetarian daughter once took him to a vegan restaurant where he tried soy meat for the first time. It is incomprehensible to me why anyone would want to eat fake meat, he said. Can't you just eat normally? That's how the article ends. So of course there's always going to be people like that who are just close-minded and ignorant. But thankfully there are also going to be, in increasing numbers, I believe people like his daughter who are making those connections, trying new foods, encouraging their friends and family to do the same and that gives me hope. It seems like currently one of the biggest barriers of entry for people who are curious are certain cultural and societal norms within South Korea. Maybe all they need is more representation and thankfully it seems like that is slowly happening. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I love learning about different cultures and their relationships to animal products. I find it really fascinating and important to better understand the challenges of making the world a better place for animals. And it's also always nice to see veganism being discussed in mainstream publications like the Washington Post. Overall, I found this article to be pretty uplifting, but I'd love to hear what you guys thought, so let me know. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, subscribe for more of my videos, tap the bell to be notified when I upload, and I'll see you again soon. Bye!